So let's, uh, let's, let's pray. So Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have today. Thank you for bringing us together and to look into your word and to gain an insight into understanding of what you want us to learn, understand, and, and know from this point forward. And Father, we just ask you to continue to have our hearts be grateful and be thankful for who you are, what you've done in our lives. We thank you for what you uh, continue to do and pray to keep us safe and together on uh, this Mother's Day and your mother this weekend and have a time of reflection of gratitude for what you've provided to us and the persons that express love and compassion to us. So Father, we look down to your word, be our pastor, our guide, our teacher, our shepherd in this time. We thank you and ask you these things in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, uh, so, yeah? Yes, sir. I'm ready. Okay, let's go. All right, since, um, well, you're, I put the questions in order of how they were received, but since you're online first, I'll skip around a little bit, and I'll go to yours first, since you're here, and everybody else isn't here yet, so maybe I don't know what the deal is there. So, your, what? Do you have a battery over there already? So in, in Luke twenty thirty five, what you have is the comment you were making before when you said about the question of you said no marriage in heaven, the man and Eve are married in the Garden of Eden, a type of heaven on earth. So your question was, how can they be married in the Garden of Eden as a type of heaven on earth when there's no marriage in heaven? So you're basing that, of course, on the comment that he makes in Luke twenty. In verse 34, and Jesus said to them, children of this, this age, of the age this, um, are, are given in marriage. And he goes on to say, uh, but those, those deemed worthy to obtain the, that age, or the age this, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. So that's what you're talking about in re regards to how we know there's no marriage in heaven, for they shall die no more because they are like angels and sons of the God, sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So, you, and of course, other aspects of how you, we know for a fact that there's no blood relation anymore in in uh, that 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 context. So, the reality, the the key is this: um, what you just talked about is is a very big deal because this goes back to what I was talking about before, long ago, a long time ago, and the issue is about um, marriage. on earth is equals one flesh which is defined as defines as two souls becoming one Right? Which you can elaborate on and say that the blood of man and woman and the DNA, right? The DNA. So they procreate. child, right? And they're born in sin. Now, that's on the earth, okay? So the problem is that in the, on the Garden of Eden, which you mentioned is a very good point, the Garden of Eden, marriage in the Garden of Eden, original one flesh was man and woman here's the key there was no blood there's no blood so it's not the marriage that you think of as we say today when he says marriage given in marriage he means to have one flesh to to do what we do today. Now we do know 
couple things here. So I, first I want to preface, but don't forget, don't forget Jude, first of all. So you may, this may freak you out when you say, no blood, what the heck, what? So if you remember Jude, if you go to Jude, to remind you of something here, when he says in Jude 7, well, 6 and 7, and those angels who kept not their own principality but left their own habitation, he kept in perpetual darkness, under thick darkness, for the judgment of the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, which in like manner to these committed fornication and went after strange flesh. So the angels did like they did, and it says they went after heterox flesh, different flesh from their own, which typifies, so Jude 6 and 7 tells us Jude 6 and 7 equals angels have flesh and no blood. They're spiritual beings, right? Then we know about Jesus when he said, I'm a spirit, I have flesh and bone, no blood. So we also know that Jesus resurrected, that is. Whoops. No blood. And that's in Luke, if you turn there, for, I'll go over to Genesis in a moment, but I want to make sure I put this preface down, that there is references in, the, in this comment about there being flesh with no blood. But it's essential to understand this question because the issue is what kind of marriage it is. Hence, that's why we're in heaven where the marriage feast, right? Because there's a bride and bridegroom as a, as a wedding, but not in the same way we think of today. So, in Luke... 24, 25, I think it is. No. So it's in um, I, uh, no, 24, verse 39. See my hands and my feet that I am. Handle me and be, con be conceived. Yeah, be convinced, conceived. Be convinced, excuse me. For a spirit has not both flesh and bones as you have as you see me have. So Luke 24, 39. So the reality is the reason why, going back to, to the premise, is that remember that Ha Adam, the man and Eve, going back to Genesis, you go back to Genesis. To remind you, so it says that in verse chapter 2, verse 7, remember, and Kave Elohim, Genesis 2, 7, formed the man of the dust of the earth and breathed, or <sighs> he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, God's spirit, God's, God's spirit. He gave man that. So God's neshimah, breath of life, he gave to man, and man became a living soul, a nefesh. So God gave him out of his spirit, a neshimah, he breathed the breath of life, so he became, we became a nefesh. So his spirit animated us into a living soul. And ergo, his spirit was always animating us through the man and the woman, representing mankind in spirit. So, in Genesis 2, 7, I'm out of 6, supposed to be a G. Mankind animated by spirit not blood. Okay? Now, so when you see that, then you know that going forward, when in chapter 2, verse 22, the Lord, the Chave Elohim, 
had taken out of the man and built or sculpted a woman and brought her to Ad ha Adam and ha Adam said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. He didn't say blood of my blood, right? She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they should be one flesh. So in Genesis, so later on in chapter, whoop, in verse 22 to 24, bone of bone and flesh of flesh. No blood. No blood. Which is why the translation of DNA or or they say a rib, because a rib you have in there. Now, here's the interesting part. We all know that bones have marrow in them, so you go, okay, marrow in the bone. People say, well, how can you have a bone without blood because marrow's in the bone? Well, Jesus talked about having flesh and bone and no blood um, because spirits don't have flesh and bone. Jesus had no blood. He's animated by the spirit. Hence, there's a difference there. So there is a time we know that angels had flesh and did not have blood because they went after heterox flesh, Jude 6 and 7, which means if it's different from flesh, that means they had flesh, which is the reason why they, earlier on in Genesis, were told to procreate, which is why there was a new set of angels that were told to again replenish um, because there's flesh can procreate. But the blood is the difference. The blood is the, is the aspect of that. So when you talk about bone of bone and flesh of flesh, there's no mention of blood in Genesis 2, verse 22 and 24. Then as you go further on, of course, when you go uh, earlier, we're going back to Genesis chapter 2, he, he says there, um, going back to verse 15, and he said in verse chapter no, chapter two, not verse fifteen. Yeah, verse fifteen. And God took the ha adam, the man, and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the Lord God, Chave Elohim, commanded the man, saying, "Of every tree of the garden you shall eat freely, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of, for in the day you eat thereof thou shalt surely die." Okay, so we know that sin bringing forth death. The reason why sin brought forth death is because what happened is this. When you partake of sin, blood well, how do you say this? I'll put it rightly. No longer animated. Ugh, if I can. And no longer animated by the Spirit, but by blood. So that's the key right there. So as soon as you, as soon as you partake of sin, you're no longer animated by, by the Spirit, they're animated by the blood. And that blood represents the tainted soul. When blood comes under the soul, so over here, so I'll put this over here um, somewhere. Hmm, over here. Blood in the soul of man equals sin. bringing forth death. That's why the blood in the soul of man equals the sin bringing forth death. That's why when he says in Leviticus, your life is in the blood thereof. Because our life now, what used to be in the spirit, is now in the blood. Our life, our nephesh, came alive by God's neshima spirit. Now our nephesh is dependent upon the blood instead of the spirit. And that's the reason why there's a difference in the Garden of Eden marriage, because they first were married in spirit, not in blood. So the marriage that God speaks to when he says there's no marriage in heaven 
is in reference to what we understand in this life what marriage is. Interesting enough, we do know, because this is interesting, you brought, it's a great question, Tracy. Some may think is not important, but your question is very good because it's insightful into the future day of day seven that when Christ will be fulfilling his kingship office as the Messiah, as he is procuring a bride, from, from that point at the end of day seven, going to day eight, he will then be the bridegroom with his bride. There'll be a marriage. There'll be a marriage feast. And people always wonder, what the heck does that mean? Well, they're now one flesh and spirit, not in blood. And so that's the whole issue behind the bride and the bridegroom. So your question is extremely huge. And the fact that we believe in marriage as we know as what we see today in this world, which is with a flesh, blood, and bone, humans, man and woman, getting together and having a family unit. However, God intended to have the man and the woman without blood in spirit come together and actually, at this point, have procreation of other children of flesh and bone, no blood, which is interesting, which is what the angelic host did, as we know from before. So the marriage in heaven issue, to again could answer your question, the reason why there was marriage in the Garden of Eden as a type of heaven, because it typifies the bride and the bridegroom being one flesh and spirit, not in blood. And the reason why Jesus said there's no marriage in heaven later on in Luke 20, 35, is because they don't give into marriage and so forth, is because of the fact that marriage as we know it and the post-sin world is with flesh, blood, and bone. There's nobody who can be married <laughs> any other way because uh, we're all flesh, blood, and bone. We don't know what it's like to have a spiritual, unified marriage apart from blood. We have no way of knowing that, which is why it's even more important for people today who are of flesh, blood, and bone to acquiesce, to submit to the covenant of marriage in the spirit because it's a more important reality to have that as a system of understanding and importance and priority to have God in your marriage by submitting to his rules, by going through the process of treating it with respect and reverence because you're acknowledging how it was at the beginning. It was in spirit, not in blood. And by getting married just by flesh, blood, and bone, desires of, of our thoughts and minds and hearts, then you're ignoring the original intent of marriage, which was based upon a spiritual union, not a blood union which unfortunately is the reason why half of marriages today, in Christ or not, end up in divorce because they base it on eros love. They base it on affection. They base it on lust. They base it on affinity and emotion, which is based on flesh, blood, and bone. They don't base it on spirit, which is based on principles, morals, ethics of God and his word. And it goes deeper than what you can see, think, and experience in this life. So that's what the marriage in the Garden of Eden was to represent, the spiritual marriage of the bridegroom and the bride versus the marriage that he referenced. He mentions is not going to be in heaven anymore, which is of our flesh, blood, and bone for the purpose of just getting through this life, which also speaks to the simple pleasures that we have in this life of a mother, father, husband, wife, child relationship. Those are our pleasures of this life. We don't need any more because we have one father in heaven and we have one family in heaven, not multiple families. So we have that now for the pleasures of this life, but we don't need that any longer in heaven. And so it's a spiritual issue versus a blood issue. So that answers your question. So Tracy, you tell me, is that a satisfactory answer to your question? Yes, what's your question, babe? Sorry. And Tracy said, okay, so it is more a reflection of the bonding of Christ with his church or with the bride? You got Since it. Since the bride is not the whole church, what about Christ and the church? It's, it's Christ, because remember the woman who was built it's Christ said, he, I will build my church. She was sculpted and built. Eve represents the church. So um, Eve's a type of the church. So, ah, shoot, fire. Eve is the church. This is a, both are built. You got that from Genesis 2. We followed the verse already. Uh, verse 22. 
and then you got Matthew 16, I believe it's, um, hold on. Verse 18, I will build my church. Okay, so, so they're built. Eve and the church are both built. The man, which is Adam, right? And Christ are, are not, they just, they <laughs> represent this, the original, represent the origin of life. Because the man was the first origin of life on earth from God putting him on earth as mankind, whereas Christ represents the author of life. And in Romans, he talks about this when he compares the two. In Romans 5, I get the actual verse here and show you this. In Romans 5, he says, Uh, let's find out if I can find it offhand without knowing exactly where I'm going. a momento. I want to make sure. I see different scriptures, but I want to find the one I'm really looking for. Oh, come on. Please, Lord, help me find it. It's not that far. Hold on. There's one where he says that speaks of Christ as mm, the second Adam, and I can't, uh, I do apologize, I should know where this is, and I just, I'm losing, mm. Mm. Um. darn it, hold on. Let me just really go uh, real quick and I'll find it for you. I'm sorry. Okay. All right, so as I'm looking at this, let me see here. Okay, there it is. Romans 5, I was in the right place when he says, yeah, okay, and it's in, wait, well, can, okay, here it is, right here. I was, I was right there. So in verse 12 of Romans 5, for this one reason through one man sin entered into the world and whom all sinned and through sin death, so also death passed on to all men, Romans 5, 12. For till the law sin was in the world, but sin also not counted where there is law. Death, however, reigned from Adam till Moses, even, our, even over those who had not sinned in the similitude of transgressions of Adam, who is a type of that being about to come. And, of course, it talks about Christ at this point, further later, continuing on. And so he says that death, in verse 21, uh, sin reigned by death, so also, the, so also favor gra or grace might reign through the righteousness of the anointed life through Christ our Lord. But in Romans 5 is the issues of 
Ha'adam being the first Adam and Christ being the second Adam. So there's this whole process of thought from Romans 5, 12 to 21 of that process of this is the man and Christ origin of life. They both are representing, representing origin of life where God started the origin of life on earth through Ha'adam and Christ being the author of life. It's a foreshadowing of that. That's what that speaks to. So there's your bride and your, it is your bridegroom. So type. And this is your type of the bride. So you see that aspect of hopefully what I just said there. So Tracy, do you tell me, does that answer your question sufficiently? I'm not sure if I did that enough, but hopefully it answers your question sufficiently that you had. Okay. So and there's another, I'm not finding it right offhand, but I could have sworn there's another, and there's also a course, I, I almost remember this, in 1 Corinthians 15, there's also the definite um, passage where he says in 1 Corinthians 15, when he said um, about comparing uh, Christ and, and, and Adam, Ha'adam, it's in um, 1 Corinthians 15, 21, for since through a man there is death, through a man also there is resurrection of the dead, for also by Ha'adam we all die, so the anointed also we restored the life. So he compares the two again, the one who caused death versus the one who brought us life. So that's 1 Corinthians 15, 21. So you can come down to, again, 1 Corinthians 15, 21. So, all right. So with that being said, we go back to Sheila's question. Sheila asked a question, and Sheila said, um, based on Matthew, she was actually the first question we had from last week, and I didn't do this Q&A on Friday, so my apologies, Sister Sheila, our, our dearest, precious sister across the pond over there in England, jolly old England, the origin of our country, which is interesting. Our country came out of England in King George, so she's in the origin of who we are as America. How cool is that? So in Matthew 20, uh, not 20, 12, excuse me, in Matthew 12, the question there is about uh, the Queen of Sheba. And the issue being, uh, well, it doesn't say that, but that's what it's referring to. And her question is about the, the sign of Jonah in, in Matthew 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes answered them, saying, Teacher, we desire to witness a sign from you. He answered and said to them, A wicked and faithless generation demands a sign. But no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the stomach of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And in Matthew 12, 41, he says, the Ninevites will stand up, or Anastasis, in the judgment against the generation of this, and cause it to be condemned. For they were formed, which, of course, that, that there is the metanoia, uh, at the warning of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment, which the bottom of your diglot there in page 52, it says in the Old Testament, that's referring to Sheba, who's the Queen of Sheba who came to see Solomon in all the glory, because he even talks about that later on. So again, Queen of the South rise up, will rise up Egero, not Anastasis, at the judgment against the generation this, and cause it to be condemned, for she came from a distant land, or a land far off, Paros, with far limits, to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So Sheila's question, based on that coupling of verses, is the fact that, okay, wait a second here, what did the Queen of the South hear that will allow her to rise up? Wise, rise up rather than stand up because the phrasing is Anastasis here versus Egero here against in the, gener in the judgment against, which is the topic of the generation this, which is day seven. So the generation this is day seven. So the context here is actually referring to chart 24, or 22, excuse me, chart 22, the resurrection and the life. So when you're a gyro, you're raised into a position from a horizontal to a vertical. That's all that means. So you're raised up. So now we know that a gyro, okay, has a representation to, to raising up, 
to vertical position. Whereas anastasis is to stand. Whoops. Which is to stand again. Refers to a blessing and honor. Whereas this one refers to a blessing. The words of themselves, okay? So a gear refers to be, being blessed to be, able to, to be able to be raised. It's a blessing to be brought back to life, obviously, from a, from a horizontal to a vertical in its core. And anastasis means to not just be brought from horizontal to vertical, but to actually be able to stand and therefore not just be raised horizontal, but to actually stand in a blessing and be honored. So there's a reference to an, an inheritance when you talk about anastasis. So the interesting part is that the Ninevites who were, who were formed, it says they were stand up in the anastasis. However, there's two parts of the anastasis. There's the Mia anastasis, where you're being um, blessed and being of honor. So all people get egeroed, right? All people get egeroed. All people are raised. You know, some to some to judgment. Well, I don't know if I'm going to get off topic here. Let's just say all people are raised. I'm not going to get off topic. That's off topic totally. All people are raised, okay? which is Igirod. Now, the question that Sheila's asking is, well, wait, wait, wait a second. Then, then why, why, what did she hear? It's the, the thing is, you're saying hear, but the reality is there's nothing that refers to her hearing something. The reality is, is not so much what she heard, but rather the timing of her against against uh, against them, which is the generation this, and she rising up. Okay, it's the timing, not so much the hearing. That's the that's the difference in the question that you asked, Sister Sheila. Is that you said, "What did she hear?" It's not what she heard. It's the timing from which she's against. The, against them that she's rising up against. So the reality is this, Queen of Sheba, who goes to see Solomon, even though Igiro represents rising from a vertical to, I mean, to a vertical position, refers to it being a blessing, which is all people, when you first get raised, it's a blessing. You get raised from life to death. The problem is after that, you're not so blessed when you go from life, from death to life, now to incur a judgment, a, a total annihilation in Jehoshaphat. It's pretty, pretty severe stuff there that happens. But to be raised from, from death to life, initially, you're thinking, that's a blessing. Eh, not necessarily, because it doesn't sustain itself depending on what you were egeroed for. Were you egeroed from death to life to be blessed only to then, because that's a blessing, to go from death to life as a, as a core issue. But then you go from death to life unto what? Unto Jehoshaphat? Unto Hades Gehenna? Unto, unto what? Unto the messianic reign as an earthly one, as an inheritor of the earth, as an enter into the heavens? What is it that you're a Giroad for? Um, so being a Giroad really isn't that great of a thing in and of itself, but it is a blessing, no doubt. When you think of it, you say, how can it not be? You're, you're dead, now you're alive again. I just saw a recent story of a, of, a, of a young man whose true story, his father died, and the hospital pronounced him dead. And at his deathbed, he said, no, Dad, you're not dead, no, Dad, you're not dead. And then all of a sudden, his heartbeat started to beat again. It's a true story. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I mean, the hospital doctors pronounced him dead. He was gone and flatlined, unplugged them. They were down to wheel him away. And he said, no, no, no. And he, this really happened. And he said, you know, he just prayed and said, you know, you're not dead, Dad. Please, God, please, God. He's not dead. He's not dead. And all of a sudden, boop, boop, boop. And I'm like, what? They're just unplugging everything. And that was the last thing. I'm like, that's crazy. And then he's now alive and he has a pacemaker and a defibrillator and all that stuff. But still, he's alive and it's insane. And so it, it just, of course, as a blessing, 
but what was he? But what was he? What was he raised back to? He was a Giroed. He was flatlined, and now he was pronounced dead, and now he's a Giroed. He's been raised to a vertical position, but to what? I don't know. I mean, could he uh, give his life over to the Lord? Did, is he going to um, be taking that as a new lease on life, literally, to uh, take advantage of that? I, I can't speak to that man's good or bad indifference of that end of life situation for him. But just because he's risen back from the dead does not mean that he is going to be forevermore in a state of blessing, is my point. So it's an initial blessing, no doubt, but it's not something that's going to be a, a certainty of ongoing blessing. It all depends on what are you raised at that point to do what with that? What from that blessing are you going to do with that? So are people on the Jehoshaphat being raised for the blessing of God himself to be honored because they're all going to profess him with their mouth that he is Lord. So that's the blessing that comes out of them being raised is that he's going to now have his word be fulfilled that all, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess. So many may say, well, why? Where's their blessing for being a hero in Jehoshaphat? Well, it's not so much their blessing as much as it is the Lord's because they're being blessed to be brought back to life, to be used of God to bless him, to pay honor and homage to him, to, con to repeat the words that he is Lord, so every tongue will confess, every knee will bow. And so it goes back to the issue in the book of John, for example, when they say, why is the man born blind? And was it some of his parents that he did? He said, no, he's born blind not for his blessing to be made to be seen again, but for the blessing of God to therefore give him sight so you would know that I am he. So that's what he is saying then as he is in the future, that sometimes the blessing isn't so much for us, but it's for the Lord himself to be validated in the promises of his word and the statements of his word, as a matter of fact, that have come to pass. So in this case, the reason why she rises up is not because it's picturing her going from um, death to life, but it's picturing her going from the position on the earth, on the earth in his kingdom here, being risen up vertically, risen up to, to heaven. So it refers to her rising up, not so much it, her rising up unto, so she's rising up right here unto the protos. Anastasis. Blessed is he's part of the first resurrection, right? So the the Mia res, the Mia Anastasis, these here, this happens right here. This is the this is day seven stuff. This is day eight stuff here. The Protos Anastasis. So those who were formed from Nineveh were able to go in. So the Mia Anastasis. You can have people here that can be earthy ones. And the Mia Anastasis, because they're made to go through into the messianic reign, which is typified of those reformed Ninevites. That's why they stand up in the judgment, representing earthy ones who stand up during day seven against the generation this, who's acting like a buffoon. Because they know that's not the right way to live. They would like that. But they didn't get it all right because they didn't inherit. But they, because they just, you know, they did just enough to go turn away from the, from the sin. They didn't do enough adding fruit to put themselves in a position to be heirs. But they're not disobedient ones, thank God. They're not rebellious ones. They're not unreconciled, sanctif the unsanctified ones. They're sanctified. They're reconciled. They're just not of the fruit yield to be an inheritor. So they're reformed Ninevites who are earthy ones. So they know what it's like to go from unreconciled, unre un unsanctified, rebellious people to being blessed by God, given a chance through the prophet Jonah to get that opportunity to reform. So they reformed and they got reconciled, got sanctified, but didn't bear forth the fruit enough to be an heir. But they were still earthy ones on the earth, represented in the generation this, day seven, to speak against the judgment of what it's like to be in their shoes. Queen of Sheba represents the end of day seven, right here. This is the end of day seven. So now she gets she she rises up or Egiro she rises up in the context it's Egiro referring to a death to life situation it's going from a horizontal vertical position but it represents in this context here her being raised up into a position of being exalted into the heavens um, so that she's actually 
uh, she's rising up into the heavenlies, which speaks to those, for example, who come from the, the depths of Hades, Gehenna, because remember, there are the inheritances at the ref referenced into uh, Revelation 20 when the great white throne is there and the, and, and the books are opened. If you're in the book of life, if you're not in the book of life, then you are cast into the, the lake of fire for your portion. But all the books are open, and those in the sea get, give up in the dead. It's in it. So death and the grave. Are, so people from Hades and Canada all come forth. Those on the earth, under the earth are being judged. So the Sheba people um, and those of under the earth, all everybody being judged. So the, the Sheba folks represent those who are on the earth who had the opportunity to ascend as an heir into the heavens, which can happen in relevance to how we talked before about how he takes, you know, from the Matthew 20 passage at different points of the day, different people to partake in the same wage. And you parlay that with Matthew 22 when he goes in and gets the poor people from the by roads that don't deserve to be there, but, they're, that, but the wedding is filled with these people that are given uh, that garment. Well, these people are, remember, you could be going up, okay? They, they're, getting, they're rising up. So the Queen of Sea represents those who rise up unto a protos anastasis uh, in the heavenly realm. They rise up to that place because at the end of day seven, you have the judgment going on. You also have the inspection going on in the heavens. So the inspection in the heavens, she, so there's going to be a people there inspected in the heavens who are going to be chosen out of, as we know, that's what it means when it says they are called out, chosen, chosen out, called out of those who are there, wise and foolish, and those who have the garments not soiled, that knit their garment, right? So she's rising up, she's rising up to, to the next feast or the dipnon. So the reason why she's not Anastasis, because she represents not the Mia Anastasis, represents the Deuteros, I mean the Deuteros, the Protos Anastasis, which in order to get there, you must rise up be, because the Father inspects you and rises you to another level into the Dipnon if you're worthy of being the bride. So the Queen of Sea represents, that's why he, she is depicted as a woman who many would say the Queen of Sheba and Solomon had procreation, had kids, and some people in Africa say they're Jews. That's where all that comes from because Solomon definitely was a philanderer, no doubt about it. So easy to understand. He had some children of her, um, which fine if you want to say you have part Jewish bloodline in you and you're from Africa I have no problem with that the problem I have is when you start saying you're a tribe and all this kind of jazz and all blacks are Jews that's just ridiculous but to say that there's the Jewish bloodline in you of DNA I have no problem with that that's obviously the case given the number of uh, sexual relations Solomon had I got no problem with that there's a Jewish bloodline in you but to say you're part of the tribe it, it is insane that that's not the way that works so you're not a pure blood Jew, but some people get this mistaken and take that issue to a different level of insanity. So Jewish bloodline, because your interaction with Solomon and Sheba, fine. To say you're one of the Jewish tribes, you're insane. I have some bloodline of Jewish in me too in my DNA, but I'm not going to sit there and say I'm a tribe of Judah or a tribe of, that's not true. I have a bloodline in me, uh, but I'm not a pure blood Jew. I'm not like that. I, I don't have that in me. Um, but it's, you know, because it's different generations there on after. I didn't, you know, it's just not like that. So anyway, I digress. So the whole point being here for Sister Sheila is that the Anastasis of the Ninevites represents those who enter day seven as earthy ones. The rising up of Queen of Shiva represents those who rise up into the heavenlies as a protos Anastasis, as heirs of the heavens. And that's why there's a difference in the two words. But why not use Anastasis for Queen of Shiva instead of a hero? because they're referencing the rising up, being that they're up in the heavens and being risen to a different level. Uh, that's the issue there. So he's not using a gyro in that context to represent the benefit and blessing difference of being raised, but more so the position from which you're being raised from, which is the Aristotle, the Dipnon, being raised, raised up from that point. Yes? Todd said, and we have Tracy Todd and Laney. Oh, hi, Laney. Hi, it's Todd. Uh, is the book of life only opened at day eight and would that only include the people from day seven that doing time in Gehenna or Hades and come out at the great white throne with a reward 
Yeah, so day set, so the book of life is in view in both days. Uh, it's opened in day eight to, for the judgment. In day seven, it, if you're not in the book of life for day seven, you don't have any life of entrance into the heavens or inheritance on the earth. So in day, the book of life is in view in both days. In day seven, it's a view to entrance of the heavens or inheritance on the earth. In day eight, it's exclusive to inheritance only. You have to be, if you don't, I'm not in the book of life, you do not inherit the heavens. You, you can't, you don't pass go. That's he the whole said, deal. He said, okay. Yeah, so the book of life in, in a nutshell is about inheritance on the earth for day seven or in the heavens for day eight. That's what it's about. It's about being inherited or disinherited and, and or in a position to, for, for day seven, the only thing difference is it has also a view to inheritance for those who enter the heavens. But the book of life, it deals with inheritance. No doubt about it. It's either to have inheritance in day, day seven and or a view to inheritance by entering the heavens in day seven. But in day eight, it's declaratively known. Are you are you not going to inherit day seven? Because that's, I mean, day eight, excuse me. Because that's the only, the heavens, that's the only thing left in view at that point, the great white throne. Yes? Lenny said, what was Sheila's question? Sheila's question was, on the, what, did, what did the Queen of Sheba hear that would allow her to rise up a year ago, rather than stand up Anastasis in the judgment against the generation this. The error is the word here. She didn't hear anything. She represents the timing of her rising up against them because she represents those who rise up at the end of day seven unto the protos Anastasis because she quotes from Matthew 12, 38 and 42, the days of Noah, days of Jonah, um, type of Jonah, excuse me, whereas the Mia Anastasis is why the people of Nineveh stood up to represent the earthy ones. She over here is end of day seven. She represents the heirs of heaven, which is basically the bride. So that's what Sheila's question was, but she had to wait a week for her question to be answered because of my mistake, or two weeks, because of my mistake not doing Q&A last Friday. So we covered Sheila's question. Uh, we got that one done. I really can't ask Sheila if I answered her question satisfactorily. Hopefully I did. I don't know because it's going to be a delay because God bless her. She's over there in England. And then we got Tracy's question answered. Now we got Todd and Laney's question. Um, Todd's question was on, on the board here. I have it mapped out. It was about the timing of the Passover and unleavened bread. Is there any more comments or questions, babe? Well, oh, thank you very much, Brother Todd. Well, they're not here again tonight. Yeah, well, they're not here again tonight because they wanted to know when did Jesus recognize he was the Messiah, but the last time I didn't answer it was because they weren't online. Well, they're not online again tonight, so i got to wait till next month, I guess, because if I answer it, I thought you wanted me to answer it when they're here, so I guess I'll have to wait again. Um, good point about their question because that's a question I have to answer. When did Jesus know he was the Messiah? But the reality is we waited last time because we wanted them to be online to hear it live and have interaction about that, so I have to wait again because they're not here. Um, so let's go to your question, Todd, too, here. Um, in reference to the last week of Passover, Jesus and leavened bread, you asked about the last week of Jesus, the Passover and leavened bread, point out the actual flow of, the, of the, what's going on here. So the best place to see that is in the, the Gospel of Mark. So if you go to Mark chapter 11, verse 10, well, first of all, in Matthew 21, uh, 1 to 17 and 26, 2, that gives you a timeline of the Palm Sunday, which is right here, this is Palm Sunday. And then this here, that's this part. And then this part is, is now the Passover day. So, interesting enough, you have, you have this whole process of thought going from where we're at here, right? So this goes from, I should say, 6 p.m. Well, whoops, hello. Well, I'll do it on the board a second. So the question is, go, go to, so you go to Mark in chapter 11, because it says over there, I just mentioned in two days later, and oh, not Mark, sorry, we'll just go there. I keep on getting ahead of myself. You go to Matthew 26, 2, 
he said, you know that two days hence comes the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered and crucified. Well, earlier in Matthew 21, according to our chart number 24, right, we already know that Palm Sunday came in earlier, right? And he was teaching all of a discourse all the way through this point in time, which is Matthew 26 too. So two days had gone by from Palm Sunday to now. So you got Sunday, 6 p.m. to Monday, 6 p.m., that's one day. Monday, 6 p.m., Tuesday, 6 p.m., that's two days. That puts us in Tuesday night straight up. So it says in verse 2 of Matthew 26, now you know that two days hence comes the Passover. And so for the left side of your margin, you know that after two days, so two days had been fulfilled, Sunday, Monday, one day, 6 p.m. Monday to Tuesday, 6 p.m., that's two days. We're now on day three, two days after two days, after two days, okay? So again, right here. So you got this represents here, Sunday, 6 p.m. to Monday, 6 p.m. That's one day. Then you got Monday, 6 p.m. to Tuesday, 6 p.m. That's that's day. It's day two. Whoops. That's day two right here. That's day two, okay? And then he says, now after two days, which means we're after Tuesday at 6 p.m. So in Matthew 26, 2, this is Tuesday after 6 p.m. That's what that represents in Matthew 26, 2. Yes? Yes? Not the, not, well, it's going back to Jesus coming in on Palm Sunday. So the Sabbath's already over, remember? The Sabbath was from Friday at 6 p.m. to su Saturday at 6 p.m. He came in on Palm Sunday, which is not Sabbath. It's the day after the Sabbath, right? So he comes in on Sunday morning, the Palm Sunday. And it's two days after that point. So Sunday morning still counts as Saturday to the Jew because it's Saturday 6 p.m. to Sunday 6 p.m., right? So Palm Sunday was actually on their Saturday. I know it's confusing and freaking doodle, but you got to understand how the Jewish people, you know, count their calendar. So Saturday at 6 p.m. begins Sunday. All right. So that's how that works. So you have you have the reality there already in play. So Sunday, Palm Sunday was still Palm Sunday, but it counts as, you know, it started the previous 6 p.m. was Sunday night, then Sunday morning. So Sunday night begins Monday and then Monday night. You know, so that's so. So it's not the Sabbath's already over. At Saturday at 6 p.m., it's over. Then the Palm Sunday, and then it's two days from Palm Sunday. I think you just must have misspoke. Yes? Yes. Yes, I'll put that on the side to remind you. So the Sabbath is Friday, 6 p.m., to Saturday, 6 p.m. And just so you know, even to this day, this is what Seventh-day Adventist Jews still respect and understand. That's the Sabbath. It's Friday. And people will say, Christianity is wrong. The Sabbath didn't change. I never said it did. But people in church entity do say it changed because they're not thinking, because they're, <laughs> they're, not, they're out to lunch. The Sabbath did not change. It's always has been, always will be, Friday 6 p.m. to Saturday at 6 p.m. I got no problem with that. Well, then why don't you worship on the Sabbath? Well, actually, we are right now, interesting enough, but not because of that reason. It just happened to be that that's what God ordained for us to do because of my work schedule issue and being bivocational is why we do Friday night study. It's not because we're some Hebrew roots, Judaic honoring law system of abiders. That's not what we're doing. It just so happens to be on this, on this day. It was not intended to be that way. Uh, for that reason. However, I find it ironic that it is, in fact, honoring the Sabbath, but in a different context of the reasons why behind it and the motivation behind it is not for that reason. We are doing it by a sovereign hand of God, not because of our volitional will to do so, nor is it my desire to point that out as some highlight reason as to why. But I just want to make sure, as a matter of fact, though, it kind of like God's kind of covering the bases there. 
of saying, you know, hey, we are doing it, but we kind of backed into it, okay? So, but we don't, we don't have a rigidness about the Sabbath issue. And the reason why the Sabbath never changed is because it's a law of God that didn't change. However, that's a representation of the celebration of God's restoration of Genesis. His original restoration account, he rested on the Sabbath. And so he wanted everybody else to rest on the Sabbath of his Jews, Jewish people. He also mentioned a perpetual sign forever leading to their day of rest in the Messianic kingdom. So that's it pointed out to a Messianic kingdom out ahead, and there was no Messiah at the time when he restored the earth and rested on the Sabbath. It ergo would lead you to understand some things have to happen between the original rest that was ordained and the rest out of head he points out. So a lot of stuff has happened in between there, as in a Messiah has to come and fulfill the prophecies. And ergo, therefore, the fulfilling of said prophecies and the Messiah himself coming would have a higher priority and preeminence over the original rest. Ada. So the original rest was a prelude to the, to the forefront rest out ahead. It would then preclude you to understand that the rest out ahead is more important than the original rest. However, the original rest cannot be eliminated because it would then devalue what God did there as well. So you don't devalue God's work by no means. You just bring higher value on what he points out ahead, which was the reason for the original rest was to point to the ultimate rest and the Masonic reign. Which is why that when he rose again from the dead on Saturday at midnight, this was now no longer the Sabbath, it was now Sunday. We worship on Sunday, the first day of the week. Why? Not to do away with the Sabbath, but to augment the fact that his original rest, which points to the messianic rest, we're going to celebrate now the Messiah's rest from all of his work that he has finished on our redemptiveness, our redemptive act of our uh, he purchases us from his blood, I should say, his apolutrosis, I should say, not, so his, his, his uh, sorry, uh, that, that's, that's redemption. His agorazo, his purchasing of us from his blood has been accomplished at the cross. His agorazo purchasing us at the cross was accomplished and completed on Sunday when he fulfilled the three days and three nights of the sign of Jonah, and he rose. Now the agorazo has been completed. The sin debt was paid, but the purchase was not fulfilled yet until all those people from Hades and Abraham's bosom were brought up to heaven when the ca when checks were cashed. Now he's purchased. Now the purchase is complete. Hence, the purchasing of completion has now been celebrated on Sunday to represent a beginning of understanding of what the Messiah came to do was to bring us all into his rest out of head. We can't be in his rest out of head, which was the reason why God rested from his restorative work unless you have the Messianic blood to purchase us to make us eligible for that rest. So therefore, we celebrate and worship His purchasing of us to have the ability and eligibility to be in that day of rest. So that's why I don't have any problem with, with honoring the Sabbath and God's restorative work, but not in a legalistic sense, by no means. It is nothing more, nothing more, than a, than a sign to point to the real rest out of head, which is, again, precursored on the purchasing power of God Almighty's blood and God the Son, which gave us the eligibility to be a part of that rest. So what's in your mind cells, I don't understand, that you don't, under, don't, you don't get the emphasis and the huge import into the resurrection of Christ. It's a big deal. So we make a big deal out of that because he said that without his resurrection, none of the word would be validated. And ergo, the, res the rest he originally had in that Sabbath would be invalidated if he didn't raise from the dead, which by his own words, therefore, puts his resurrection day preeminent over that day of rest. Ergo, the apostles go, we get it. That's why they had the first day of the week broke bread. That's why they met on the first day of the week, the scripture says in the book of Acts. So we're good to go. So that's what they did. So that is what it is. So they met on Sunday. That's why the first, oh, the church fathers met on Sunday. That's what they did. So in any event, I digress on that issue, but that's a whole separate, separate issue. But I want to make sure I answered that question. If it did come up in your thoughts, I think I nailed that down. All right, so Mark 11.10. Go to the scripture for Mark and the timeline, your question. Mark 11.10. Mark 11, verse 10. And he says, to give you the context, Blessed be the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. This is talking about Palm Sunday. Pretty clear. That's the Mia Day 1 of Passover, Inspection Day, which is on your chart number 24. Right? Plus other scriptures speak to Palm Sunday, we know. 
but Luke, Mark 11:10 is the best timeline to follow to answer the question of the bouncing ball. Matthew's a prelude to it, so you can kind of see it there a little bit, but you want to solve the bouncing ball more easy to follow. Mark 11:10 clearly Palm Sunday in the context of the verses leading up to verse 10. It's clearly Palm Sunday, verse 8 clears that out too. If you want to say verse 8 to 10, you got it pretty much nailed down. You know what's up. If you read Mark 11, 8 to 10, and you don't see that's Palm Sunday, then you got issues. I don't know what to tell you. You got issues. You just can't read. I don't know what's going on. It's pretty clear to me. It's Palm Sunday. Now, that's the Mia day of the Passover. You say, well, whatever. Well, that's the day that the Lamb of God was coming into Jerusalem on Sunday. Okay? So it's the second half of Sunday because the first half of Sunday was 6 p.m. already on Saturday the, night the day before through Sunday morning. So he comes in Palm Sunday, which is technically still Sunday to the Jew and the Gentile. He's coming in. And they all come in on Sunday to present their lambs as they can go through. But So here's all of Israel, Israel coming and all the other Gentiles coming to worship God with their lambs unspotted and unblemished. And here's God the Father saying, I got my lamb. And no one saw that. No one, no one really got that going on there. But that was going, that's what was going on. And all this blood was going to be you know, leaving the city out as they sacrifice all these lambs. And here's the true blood of the Lamb of God who took away their sin, is, is right there. Their Azazel, Azazel, scapegoat was right there. Anyway, I digress. So Mark eleven twelve. Then he says right there, in verse 11, he spent the night in Bethany. Verse 12, the next day. So what, what, how, how hard is that to understand? What day is that? Well, it's Monday, right? Uh, right, duh, right? So if that's Sunday, and the next day, well, that's Monday. That's not hard to figure out. It's very simple. Keep reading that. And then he goes on to seeing a fig tree and, then in verse 19, it was evening. Well, wait a minute. If the next day is Monday morning, and now it's evening, it's Monday night. Well, to a Jew, what's Monday night at 6 p.m.? Well, that'd be Tuesday. You're welcome, right? So it's Tuesday now on Mark 19, 11, 19 to 20. So you're going on Tuesday, because it's, because it's Monday, 6 p.m. And then he goes on to even say in verse 20, and it passed along in the morning. Now it's Tuesday morning, right? So... Monday is verse 12. Luke 19 is, is Monday night, which actually counts as Tuesday. But to make it really clear, in verse 20, he says, passing along in the morning, which is clearly Tuesday. Now, if you can't see that, again, you're willfully blind. Or you just can't read. I don't know what's going on. Pretty clear. Pretty crystal clear. Going into Mark chapter 1, chapter 11, for a couple of verses up to verse 10, it's Sunday. Declaratively, that is Sunday all day long. Verse 12, Monday, all day long. Verse 20 of Mark 11, all day long, that's Tuesday. All day long. So you can't, you know, if you don't see that, again, something's wrong. But that's clear, right? So now we go into, as you see from there, he goes on to then in verse 20 on, continue to go through and he teaches again about his teaching he does on, these, on this day of Tuesday um, morning leading up to Tuesday night. As you continue to read through this, and if you were to read through, but there's no other, this is all just him teaching about what he's teaching about uh, regarding his, his great uh, Sermon on the Mount, plus other things he does. And as you continue to move on, going back to Tracy's question again, um, she mentioned about um, mar marriage in heaven. And in verse 25 of Mark 12, he said, For when there shall rise from the dead, there will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but as those angels in the heavens. We answered that question earlier. There's another reference to that I mentioned earlier to other places. But again, Jesus continues to talk about the, the, the sermon he gives. You continue to go through Mark 12. You continue to turn your page. And then you go into, uh, again, Mark 13, leaves the temple. He's still teaching the whole time, leaves the temple. And, and he talks about uh, raising, uh, but once you, you know, he's going to destroy this temple. And uh, he's going to say, I'm going to raise this temple. Um, excuse me, in verse 2, he said, there shall not be a stone upon stone be overthrown in this temple. And then, of course, you have the disciples going, asking the question about, as we know about, when will these things be? Again, he's still teaching, still on Tuesday. You turn the page again in your dialogue. lot. You keep reading again. He's still talking about the, miss, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. He's still teaching. And then as you continue to see, um, he talks about in verse 28 of chapter 13 of Matthew, the fig tree parable. Again, Sermon on the Mount, still teaching. Then all of a sudden in chapter 14, verse 1, now, after two days, the Passover, well, what day is it? After two days. Two days has been fulfilled. It's now Tuesday night. 
I mean, again, you just got to follow the bouncing ball, man. He's, he's, he's telling you it's Tuesday morning, and all the way from Mark, from chapter 11, 20, all the way through chapter 14, verse 2, it was Tuesday morning. It was all day long he was teaching. And now it's after two days. What two days? Well, I, just, I told you right here. Sunday, 6 p.m. to Monday, that's one day. Monday, 6 p.m. to 6, that's two days. So now it's after 6 p.m. It's after 6. And now's the Last Supper. Now it's time for the Last Supper. Because now, according to the Scripture, it must be between the evenings of Tuesday at 6 p.m. and Wednesday at 6 p.m. You must have Passover. So now is the time where Jesus has it as soon as possible. He has it right there. And that's why you have on, the, on your chart, 24, he goes through, and I go through, and I put out the, the Mia day of the Passover is Sunday. The Protos day of Passover is on Monday. The Mia day of, Pas of the Unleavened Bread starts on Monday at 6 p.m., ends on Tuesday at 6 p.m. So you can't have the Passover meal until the Unleavened Bread piece of it is, is taken care of. All leaven has to be out of the house before you partake of the lamb because it represents having no sin when you partake. Hence, when we do the Last Supper, the Apostle Paul, as the writer, by the author God himself, told him to tell us we cannot go into that, that, that celebration or that, that ordinance without inspecting ourselves inside our own heart, mind, and spirit, right? Because if we don't do the right thing in partaking of the blood and, and, and the representation of the, of the flesh, then we bring sin unto ourselves. Some are weak and some are sickly among you and some sleep, he says, or as in you die. You cannot go into the communion as some haphazard, oh, I just committed five sins, I don't even care. You, you better not do that. Not cool. There's an inspection you have to do of your heart, your mind, your spirit, your soul, your body. You better check yourself. You better be right with God. You cannot go in frivolously, haphazardly, uh, lazily. You know, I don't care. You know, God forgives me. God loves me. He does all that. That's true. But you better be, be very sober-minded. You better be broken. You better be like the woman who broke out her, 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 all of her wealth that she had in the little oil of, of balsam spikenard and puts it on his feet. You better be willing to do that. Because if you don't do that and bro break and pull yourself out before God and you partake, you're in bad shape. Not cool. Not good for you, okay? So what a coincidence that in Passover there's an inspection period they have of the lamb, right? To inspect the lamb that you're bringing forth. And then, then you have this next day following that you're giving all the leaven out of your house. So first you're bringing forth your, your, your sacrifice for your sin to push your sin forward. Then you yourself are now taking your house and cleaning out all the sin of your, of your house, which is all the leaven, taking it all out. So on day one, you bring forth the lamb that this priest inspects. Sunday, six, Sunday morning, they do that through all. They do that from Sunday all the way through Monday, right? So Monday morning, now you have the Mia day of, of the unleavened bread. Mon so Monday from 6 p.m. I should say, all the way through Tuesday at 6 p.m., which is Monday in the Jewish calendar. You're taking 11 out of your house. You're taking it all out. So that you're bringing your lambs in for on Sunday, which again, don't forget. So you're bringing them on Sunday before the inspection, which happens on Monday of course, because Monday starts at Sunday at 6 p.m. So the inspection day begins on the, on the Gentile calendar. You're bringing in your inspection on Sunday to be inspected Monday, right? So you're doing that. So the inspection day begins as you're bringing it in on Sunday. So you go through on the Mia day of unleavened bread, and you get all living out of your house. So by the time Tuesday at 6 p.m. begins, you've already brought your lamb unblemished and, un and unspotted, and you've taken all living out of your house. You've done the two things you're supposed to do. You've procured your lamb that you've raised for one year, and you brought it to the priest and said, this is on behalf of my household, unspotted, unblemished. And then you've gone back to your house and you said, skadoosh, with all the leaven, which represents no sin in your house. So you've represented to God, you've brought forth your sacrifice to God, and you've purged yourself to be ready to receive God's blessing of your sin being pushed forward one more year to then represent itself in celebration of your Passover meal as you recall the plagues of Egypt and your gratitude for being delivered by God over the angel of death. So that takes place Sunday and Monday. You're preparing your sacrifice and then yourself. And then you go into Tuesday evening is your last supper. And that's why it is the way it is in the, in the timeline. So I'm not sure if I answered your question clearly enough, Brother Todd. I hope so. But I think the real, the real, key, the real kicker to this, the real key is Mark. 
and Mark 11 is the great key of timeline of following that bouncing ball from verses uh, 8 to 10. Then you get verse, the next verses for the next day being Monday and verse 12, and the next day being Tuesday and verse 20. And then from there, you just got to follow the chapter out to chapter 14 to see now the two days had been fulfilled. Now we're on Tuesday after 6 p.m., which is the two days being fulfilled. And now we're in the time where you can now celebrate Passover, which is when Christ did that. So does that answer your question satisfactorily? I don't know. You tell me. I hope so. I don't know for sure. You, you tell me. Has it answered your question satisfactorily? Are you can a bunch of stuff in probably right now? <laughs> Is there questions I didn't get, babe? Okay. I'm not sure if I did a good enough job on that. Okay, there's no answer. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. I don't know if you're still there or not. Um, he said, I'm losing my train of thought. Okay. Okay. Now what do you say? I can't put it in words. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I know it's difficult, man. My apologies. It's easier for me to sit up here and just talk away. You have to type it all in. I, I, I get it. That's difficult. Learning different exercises in the brain. Yeah. So we'll give you time to, to do that. So I, as, you're, as you're doing that, I know it's hard to put all that into words. I, I will tell you that um, one of the things that people don't understand, the one of the biggest misnomers, two of the biggest misnomers that confuse people as to the last week of Jesus is, one, they understand there's more than one Sabbath on these holy weeks as the jews call them high holy weeks so when you have a when you have a, a week of fe a feast that feast day itself counts as a day of rest of a sabbath rest unto god because you're celebrating and commemorating a feast day whether it's feast of trumpets feast of Yom Kippur, whatever it is that day itself that it falls on becomes a sabbath in and of itself and so then the days from that sabbath from that day of celebration is a sabbath unto the Sabbaths itself, which is always Friday 6 p.m. to Saturday 6 p.m., that becomes a day of Sabbaths, plural. So that's one of the biggest confusions. People don't understand that a day of festival or feast day becomes a Sabbath in itself because you're resting and celebrating and commemorating God's will of His ordained process of doing something. And then leading up to the Sabbath, those days in between become Sabbaths in between. Um, for pe in this case, definitely between the Passover and the Sabbath itself because of those days of Passover and leavened bread put together. Yes? And Todd said, so Passover is after Tuesday, 6 p.m., and then the Sabbath begins again on Friday at 6 p.m. So, But there's Sabbaths, plural, because once you have a feast day and a festival, a celebration, that's, that, that's 6 p.m. on Tuesday. So 6 p.m., so, so the Sab so, okay, so you have Friday, 6 p.m., to Saturday, 6 p.m. is the Sabbath. Okay, that's the, that is the Sabbath, right? That's the Sabbath. Thank you. You've answered my question now more thoroughly. Yeah, but leading up to the Sabbath, Tuesday, 6 p.m. to Wednesday, 6 p.m., That actually counts also as that's a Sabbath. So that's a Sabbath. There's the Sabbath, which is Friday. But every day of the feast day, between the, between the feast day being celebrated and the, and the Sabbath, which is always Friday at 6 p.m. and Saturday at 6 p.m., between those two days, every day is a Sabbath. It's a day of rest. The Jews always understood that. Which is why in Matthew 28 it says that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb after the Sabbaths, plural. That's why it's plural. Because there's, you don't have Sabbaths, plural, unless what I'm saying is true. You don't, come to the end, and you don't come to the tomb after the Sabbaths, plural, unless what I'm saying to you is absolutely true. It is a day of rest. It's a day of understanding that in those weeks, which don't happen that much, by the way. You know, So God's feast days that he has. They celebrate the feast days, but those days of rest in between the celebration and the Sabbath day itself 
Whenever that day falls, I think up to the, they took that as an ongoing day of a commemoration onto that Sabbath. It didn't happen every single you know, week. It happened in the spring one time, and it happened also a couple more times in the fall. And that's it. So, well, a dar was added in later because that's not in the Scripture per se as ordained by God, but it is in the Scripture as God honoring the Feast of Purim. Um, in the book of Esther, he doesn't go against what Mordecai does in the celebration of the Feast of Purim, of the, of the Feast of Lots, of that their lot was cast by God to have Haman and his men killed and not the Jewish people and spared them. So that's a whole different world of understanding. But every feast day is celebrated as a Sabbath day of rest to reflect and commemorize, uh, commem commem commemorate, excuse me, that day of God's, you know, intervening, Hanukkah, same way. But that day unto the Sabbath itself is always the days of rest. Yes? Right, so how can Jesus be crucified on Passover from Tuesday 6 p.m. to Wednesday 6 p.m.? Because, be, okay, because... Because that's, okay, you're saying from a Jewish standpoint, from a Jewish standpoint, again, that's a day of commemoration, which that's seen as a day of, 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 of reflection. But I want to make, I said, I might have misspoke. So I say it's a day of, I say it's a day of Sabbath. My, my apology. My apology. I should, re, I should rewrite this. I wrote that wrong. My apology. My apology, Brother Todd. My apology. So thank you for catching me on that. So that's a Sabbath. And then you have, so you have the days of Sabbaths leading up to that. So my apology. I said Tuesday at 6 p.m. The Wednesday at 6 p.m. was a Sabbath. My mistake. So, because between, because between those two eves is when you're celebrating Passover. So you have to actually do work, obviously, to, to celebrate the Passover. So it's after the feast day is completed. My, my apology. I was including the feast day itself. That's my mistake. The feast day itself is not a Sabbath. My mistake. Again, I can't repeat it enough. My mistake. My mistake. My mistake. The feast day itself is not the Sabbath. It's when the feast day has been fulfilled, then the next day is the Sabbath. My apologies. That's on me. I misspoke totally. I was wrong. So when the feast day is over, now you're done. Now you rest up until the Sabbath, and you reflect and you commemorate what you've already done. You so said that's which is what day? Passover is Tuesday 6 p.m. to Wednesday 6 p.m. When it's fulfilled and it's over, now the days of rest begin unto the Sabbath. So the Sabbath days begin unto the Sabbath Friday. So Wednesday 6 p.m. to Thursday 6 p.m. Thursday, Thursday 6 p.m. to Friday 6 p.m. are two additional Sabbath days added into the Sabbath day of Friday 6 p.m. to Saturday 6 p.m. So that's what you got here. So again, so... So you got two days of Sabbaths leading into the day. So Wednesday to Thursday, Thursday to Friday. There's two days of Sabbaths, which is why they had to get them off the cross on Wednesday by 6, or else he was going to be not able to be taken off the cross because they have to go and rest and do no work as of 6 p.m. On, on Wednesday. That's the deal. Does that help to understand? I'm not sure if that helps. You said, okay, again, how can Jesus be crucified on Passover celebration? Please speak the days. Jesus was crucified on Passover celebration. I'm not sure what your, really, your question is. How, how can he be crucified? Because, number one, from a Roman standpoint, they could care less, right? If there's tumults, they're going to end it by doing whatever they have to do. From a Jewish standpoint, if you're asking how could they kill him on the Sabbath? It's not, like, excuse me, not a Sabbath, the Passover? Because, remember, you could do work on the Passover. That's the whole, that's the irony of the whole thing. They were breaking all kinds of laws, remember? They were, they were flat out evil. They were, 
they were judging him at midnight, totally against the law. They ripped their garment, totally against the law. They honored the Sabbath in the midst of damning him and hating him and, and bitterly despising and spitting and smacking him. Totally irrelevant. That's totally not against, that's not, no. Passover is about removing sin from your life. And they were adding fire and fuel to their sin in their life and then had the audacity to sit down for Passover. You've got to be kidding me. So to your point, it's insanity. They had no business, none, the Jewish people had no business getting engaged in the death and crucifixion of anybody on the Passover. You are correct. That's the whole point. They had no clue. They shouldn't have been doing that. The Romans, they don't, they don't care. They don't care what Passover is. They could care less. They're killing folk no matter what. So they don't care about your little feast day. No, they don't, they don't care. That's Rome, dude. They do what they want. I don't care if you want Jewish feet. Do, do your thing, dude. I'm doing my thing. So if they want to kill folk, they're going to kill folk. They don't care what day it is. So it's just that the Jews took advantage of the fact that the, the Romans are going to kill folk, and they said, let's, let's, let's kill Jesus on this day too. But God, in his ordained will, used them against their own ignorance, and he orchestrated the day of their hell-bent idea to kill him to be on the Passover day. They didn't care. They had, so if you're wondering, well, that makes no sense. They're supposed to honor the Passover. But they didn't. Why is that a big shock? At midnight, they, they judged them falsely three times. You don't, that's not the law of Moses. They didn't follow the law and how they brought him under custody and judged him. They totally just didn't even care. They were rogue, man. They were rogue. To your point, they had no business doing this. Zero. There's no law of Moses that says, on the Sabbath, I want you to murder somebody because they went against the law. Uh, you don't do that. You don't do that. Time and place, my friends. That is not time and place for that. To your point, they had no earthly business, no scriptural reference to carry out. In their minds, he was breaking the law. In their minds, that, that deserves death for blasphemy. Okay, where's the law that says you're supposed to carry that out on the Passover? There's none, to your point. That's the whole thing. That's why they're completely wicked and evil and hell-bent on hating him so much they broke their own law to kill him. It's insanity. By saying they're upholding the law, they broke the law because they hate him so much. It's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's, it's ironic. They defy him to say that you're usurping the law of Moses in order to prove their point, they break the law of Moses makes no sense. They don't value him, and to show that, they devalue the law of Moses, which they claimed he was doing. It's, it's totally oxymoronic, isn't it? That's, if, that's your, if that's your point, then you're right on point, because that's the whole thing with the Jewish people. If you're trying to make sense of that, believe me, it doesn't make any sense, because they are, this, that just shows you how the human emotion kicks in when you have, you're so filled with hate and despise and anger and bitterness and your ego of being usurped because now you're longer the ones who control the, the mood of the people and the thoughts of the people. They were upset. They were angry. They were being displaced by Christ. They no longer had the, you know, the ear of the people. They weren't the face and voice anymore of Judaism. He was. They weren't, they weren't getting the ear of the folks. He was. They weren't having the influence. He was, and so on and so on. So it drove them to do things that were all against the law, all about their evil, sinful nature, had no, con had no congruence and submission to the law of Moses. So to your point, they had no earthly business crucifying Jesus on the Passover. You are correct, but they did it anyways. I, I can't. And ironically enough, what they're supposed to be doing on the Passover is sacrificing their lambs and partaking of the feast, which ironically, their hatred and all this stuff toward Jesus caused, ca caused them to fulfill the Paschal lamb sacrifice on Wednesday that happens as they, because you could do a sacrifice early and between the eaves on Tuesday night. But there was this sacrifice of these lambs being offered at, at 9 and 12 and 9 and noon. And they fulfilled that for those who celebrated the feast later on. It's interesting how, how they fulfilled a scripture without realizing what they were doing. Just like Caiaphas when he said, it's better for one man to die, the whole nation perish. It, they, <laughs> I'm, I'm advancing your question or not, but I'm just telling, if you're, it, it frustrates me and it angers me to know that people are so filled with hatred in the Jewish people 
and that re represents me and you, by the way, and I'm not trying to make fun of them, represents humanity, that we're so hateful and so frustrated with how God wants to do stuff in our life that we're so filled with our emotional hate and disdain for Him, we'll run buckshot all the way through stuff and act like, you know, we're righteous, when in fact, by so-called fulfilling that which is righteous, we're doing that which is unrighteous, and we don't even recognize it. So that's what Paul said, remember, when he said, if you're so filled with all this, all this righteousness to Corinth when you say, I'm not an apostle, how is it that you keep on, you know, acting so hateful and bitter? Where's your love? Check yourself. 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourself to be in the faith. It, it, it's the precursor of this whole issue you're talking about. It says, we as human beings go through a heinous, evil, hateful mentality against somebody when we act like we're self-righteous and we're trying to act like we're the righteous ones instilling righteousness. But as we're doing it, we are filled with unrighteousness. We don't even see it. We're so blinded by our bitterness, our hatred, our jealousy, our pride, our arrogance. It's just, it's insane. And I'm, I'm feeling myself now getting frustrated about the, about the way that we as humans behave against God. And, and we're all guilty of this. I mean, I, I definitely am. I know I am. There's no doubt. I know I am. I don't think I am. I know I am of doing that. Yes. Sorry, I missed the other comments. Yes, Ben. Okay. said the leaders are just like liberals today. And, and Brother Todd, your, your, your comments are spot on, man. You're spot on. I mean, it's, I get emotionally frustrated. It's not with you as much as this. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm reliving the whole thing about how they could be so filled with that hatred, man. And it reminds me of, you know, people that do that to me. I do that to other people sometimes in my life. I, I know I have. You get so caught up in you saying you're going to do what the right thing is that you forget how you're doing it. You're so focused in on this is the right thing that how you go about doing it, you forsake all principles and morals and ethics of Scripture. And you, 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 you try to excuse yourself away by saying, but I know in my core this is right. Okay, that being true, how you do that, how you exercise that righteous action, how you go about in that process is immensely important. You cannot just check out with how you do something and then excuse it away by your little narrative later on while you're telling your friends about your past actions and say, well, that was what I, you know, the net result was this, that made all my actions up to that okay. No, it didn't. No, it did not. Imagine a narrative the Jews told their kids, the Pharisees and Sadducees, Sanhedrin, the scribes and elders. Well, the law of Moses says if you um, blaspheme God, that we have to take you outside as a false prophet and, and, and kill you and stone you. But since we had no ability to have the capital punishment, we used the Romans to do that for us. Aren't we good guys? Now, I can present that as a narrative that makes us sound like a righteous person. But when you, you explain the whole narrative and you go, okay, we did it by a false trial, <coughs> and we didn't <coughs> go on the Passover with the right mindset. We're supposed to be contrite and broken and sober, and I didn't tell you about that part. I left that part out, see? Well, yeah, because your narrative is trying to highlight the things that you did do by letter of the law that were kind of right, but when you look at all of the letter of the law, you violated a ton of it, and the spirit of the law, you totally devoided that, and so but they, leave, they leave that part out. So you can easily, we all do this, you, 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 we carve out, we, not they, we carve out things that we, that we did that were factual in line, leave out other factual things that we didn't meet up to, and then most of all, we cut out the entire spirit and intent of what was wrong, leave that out totally, to frame it and narrative to put us in good light. We all do this. This, this is no different. We're no different than these yahoos back in the day. We are no different. We do all the same thing, just differently. So anyway, I, I digress. Glad your answer, I'm glad your question is answered. Anyway, so now we're going to the last question. Uh, and I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna answer Greg and Sandy's question in kind of a brief answer, but I can elaborate more if they choose to do that on the last question. I'll answer those as well. But Lainey's question is, why did Jesus, well, Lainey's, Lainey's uh, sister, uh, Marcia, was asking this too. Why did Jesus disappear after the eyes were opened on those on the road to Emmaus? And that's in Luke 24, 31. So remember, he broke bread, and, they, and, they, and they, he's, just, he's gone, right? So let's read the story about, though, we are good with Brother Todd's question, right, Brother Todd? Your questions answered to us. I don't want to be rude, but we're good with your question, I think. I think you said yes. I think we're good. 
Okay, so in Luke 24, 31, and you go to that, that scripture there, when he says, uh, when he, used, he, he reclined, took a loaf in verse 30, and he, and he broke it and gave thanks, and their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he disappeared from them. So in Luke 24, 31, he, he, he does this breaking of the bread, and I'm, they're seeing, and, he, and he's gone. So the question is, why he disappeared? Why? Well, this is between the two ascensions, remember? He already appeared to Mary and said, you got to let go. i got to ascend to the Father. So he does that, puts the blood in the mercy seat. That's all done. Now he appears the road to Emmaus, but he's now going to appear later on that night in just a few hours to those apostles that have not seen him yet at all. Um, and then Thomas won't be there, of course. But he's going to be going to that and seeing them at, at that night. So it was getting toward evening, as you remember. And so my, there is no definitive answer to this question. Why did Jesus, Yeshua, disappear when they recognized who he was on the road to Emmaus as it was a coming evening? Because remember, if you go back up into, um, let me see here, verse 29 of Luke 24. But they urged him, saying, remain with us, for it is towards evening. And that means the word um, oit, oitai pros is it's a, for this it's for because of this reason it's it's in other words it's getting dark it's our word of saying dusk it's getting to be dusk okay it, it's getting to get dark out so it's not evening yet but we would say 5 p.m. so I would guess about an hour prior to evening time now we do know that he appears to the apostles after 6 p.m. it was already evening so I don't know the exact answer there's no definitive answer but my input would be based on the on factual data that we know it was getting close to evening which is dusk was about probably an hour beforehand because it says toward or post evening which is dusk which is again around five o'clock um, given don't get me wrong you might be saying do I say it's time it's bright outside on time give me a break you know I'm talking about the fact that in normal seas of those and the end of the day okay not the I savings time stuff so when you go into that Normal sea of a day, five o'clock is about dusk, going into six. And then you go into the fact that later on, in a couple hours later, he'd appear to the apostles. So my take is this, that he left because he did not want to have a, a conversation of who he was beyond what he already had displayed with them before he was then going to be with the apostles. Meaning this, the endearing moment that he, he took from them because they had a teaching moment of learning about, he showed them who he was in the Psalms and the Prophets. He opened up and, and then he broke bread and they realized who he was. So he had a teaching moment of the, helping them understand, but then when they realized who he was, he's gone. Because of the endearing moment would have then followed at that point. They would have hugged, embraced him, and so forth. He saved that moment, as we recorded in Scripture, for Mary Magdalene had an endearing moment where she embraced him. Early on, his mother and Mary Magdalene embraced them, right? So he had an endearing moment with the two Marys, Mary by herself, and then the apostles. So I would, that's my contention, that, that the Cleopas and his wife occurrence in the road to Emmaus was a, pre, was a precursor to seeing the men, the men that followed him, the apostles, the eleven that remained, by seeing them and having that endearing, compassionate moment. It's almost like he was paying respects, if you will, to the men who gave their lives for three and a half years to follow him, they deserved, if you will, not that they deserved, but they, he commanded, in a sense, a, a time to have with them that was more endearing, and he wasn't going to spend that time with these two. So having the women have an endearing time was validated because they were there with him at the cross, at the crucifixion, and leading up into being there in the resurrection morning. So you can easily see how the apostles would have no problem with that. I think they'd be hurt if they realized that Cleopas and his wife had an endearing moment before they did. It's almost like I can, I can uh, recollect to you that anytime you have somebody that's loving and endearing to you, obviously, to share a moment of joy with you, think about it. If someone in your life that you love very closely um, shares a joyous moment with someone before you and your perception is you're closer to that to your loved one than someone else is, why would they tell a friend versus telling you? That, that would kind of hurt your feelings a little bit, make you a little bit deflated, I would think. So my, my input to that is, and my take on that is, that he was paying respects to their relationship that they had built over three and a half years, and he wanted to have an endearing moment saved for them 
in that room, which is why he came back eight days later, of course, and was with Thomas as well, because Thomas had to be included in having that endearing moment. You can't just exclude one of those men. So I, I, I really believe it speaks to that. Uh, I believe that's why he disappeared from Cleophas and his wife, because he did not want to have any further than a teachable moment, and that was it. He did not have an endearing moment with them, and as soon as it was about to turn into that, he was gone, because that was saved and, and, and sacred for the two Marys together, Mary Magdalene by herself, and then the apostles. And I think that speaks to, because that would be understandable, given who had earned the right for that moment. They earned the right for that moment, those two women did, and so did the apostles. So I guess that, that's just my input. I cannot prove that. I cannot say Scripture says that, but that's my input as to why that is. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, but I hope that answers your question. So you've you got to tell me if that answers your question, Sister Laney. Okay, so I'm going to put this on the board. 